Hello everyone and welcome back to Bitwig Studio and Music Production. This is lesson 7.1 and this is our Bitwig Studio review. So right when the program was released, there were a number of reviews that came out and really that's what almost always happens with new pieces of software. Everybody wants to be the very first person to come out. And although I think that's helpful for walkthrough purposes, and you'll see that a lot of people will do their review and really more than anything else, just kind of walk through some of the basic parameters, features, and logic of the program, uh, that's not really a review. I've been lucky enough where I've worked inside the software now every day since it was released, and I've tried to do a number of different things. So I think I do have an okay perspective on what's going on inside of the software. But at the same time, we have to remember that any review is gonna be full of opinion, and I can't lie to you and say that I'm the perfect medium uh, for coming to every single person considering buying a digital audio workstation because that's just simply not true. So what I'm gonna to try to do as well is look at this from 30,000 feet. So really take a step back talk about just some of the big picture things and not really focus so much on looking at the software and how it handles this or how it handles that, but just kind of talk through why this software is unique and perhaps what it's going to offer us down the road. So if you're looking for a five minute video where I just go and say, here's the non-linear editing part, here's the linear editing part, this is what the effects look like, here's your routing options, I'm not really gonna do that because there's more than enough videos out there already and uh, I feel like it's just gonna be a waste of your time. So let's just go through this document quickly and then we will jump into Bitwig Studio for just a couple of examples. So every software has its perceived strengths and weaknesses. It's really up to you to determine what are those strengths and what are those weaknesses. From a few videos ago, we took a look at that sound on sound article and the author of that is saying there's no red button you can push for that perfect piece of software, that perfect piece of gear. The same is true with the digital audio workstation. Everybody, for whatever reason, it's just part of the 21st century and the internet and needing instant gratification, wants to know what's the best. If someone said to me, Brian, what's the best digital audio workstation? I'd answer back all of them because all of them are capable of making interesting music. Now, what you have to do, and it's the hard part, is determining from all of those choices what software is going to give you uh, the most strengths in your opinion and minimize some of those weaknesses. So anytime you open any new piece of software, you're not going to be familiar with it right away. And that's part of the problem of making a review right off the bat is if you don't fully understand the logic of everything, you're probably going to miss some of the story. And in my earlier videos and even my later videos, there are times when I know I've misspoke and have said things that uh, really probably go against the entire philosophy of the software. And one thing you want to do is work with the strengths. You know, don't try to fight the software. And even if you are experienced with DAWs, sometimes the learning curve can be quite difficult. I think it can be a little like learning to play different video games, like in the same genre, but on different consoles. So kind of imagine like you're playing FIFA 14 on the PS3 and suddenly you switch over to Pro Evolution Soccer 2015 on the Xbox One. Okay, they're both soccer games, but they're going to be completely different. There will be some similarities, but there's going to be differences. And there'll be parts of FIFA that you like, parts of the Pro Evolution Soccer you like, things about the PS4 you prefer, things about the Xbox One you prefer. And uh, it's a silly comparison, but that's kind of the way I look at comparing DAWs. There are going to be strengths. There will be weaknesses, but those strengths and weaknesses are up to you because maybe I like the way passing works in FIFA, but you prefer the way passing works in, in PES or whatever. In my opinion, you can't really accurately review something without doing your best to fully understand it. And that's why this review is coming at the very end and not the beginning. All that follows are my opinions about Bitwig Studio. This is not an overview of features or a tour around the software. There's more than enough videos on that. And to me, those videos might be labeled as reviews, but really they're probably a bit more like walkthroughs and trying to help you get started, which is totally fine. And if that's what you need, I would encourage you to seek those out and watch them. So my first point I'm going to make before going forward is that if cost is an issue for you, 
And cost is an issue for all of us, but I think when choosing a digital audio workstation, you can't let that factor in too much. Uh, but if it is an issue, just go with Reaper, which is very cheap, or use something like GarageBand until cost is not a factor in your decision-making process. So if cost is really important to you, get the cheapest thing, figure out how that works. And if you're still really passionate about this moving forward, um, you know, you have to kind of widen that budget a little bit. And there's a reason for it. And that's what we're going to go over next for everybody else. And this is by far the only factor you need to consider when buying a digital audio workstation or a plugin or whatever is go with whatever software you think you will make the most music in. Not necessarily the best music in, but the most music in. What software will you have no problems opening up every day and getting to work? What's going to keep you inspired? And sadly, I can't necessarily give you all of the little features to consider. That's just up to you. Now, for me, I pretty much base my decision-making process on layout and aesthetic. So Bitwig Studio looks really clean. It looks really nice. It has a nice kind of dark scheme to it. Moving around is simple. I understand how all this stuff is working. And it's an inspiring piece of software. It really is. At least for me, it's an inspiring piece of software. I know when opening up Pro Tools, you just kind of feel like you're going to be going into the trenches and doing a lot of mundane work. That's not always true. I'm not saying that's what's going to happen when you open Pro Tools, but just the look of it kind of gives you that feeling, or at least it does to me. And so in my opinion, to make the most music, I need to feel like the look of the software is going to work for me. And so that's kind of how I make my choices. I know it's silly. It doesn't seem like that should be the reason you do it. Uh, but if you are working in something every day and you know that you're capable of making interesting music in any software, then look becomes very important. All right, let's go over some additional questions to ask. One of them is, what do I need this for? And I think every digital audio workstation is capable of doing all of these things, tracking, mixing, producing, mastering, live performance being maybe a bit of an exception, and then, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Now, again, this is where you have to judge strengths and weaknesses for yourself. There will be aspects of Pro Tools that might make tracking seem uh, if you are doing a lot of tracking, it may seem like you should be using Pro Tools because it gives you the most options, the most control, the most flexibility. And that might be true, but there might be cases where that becomes too much for you and it starts to get in the way, in which case you want those options to become simpler, right? Just because you have more doesn't mean it's always better. Number two, how important are built-in components and like how many do you need or how many do you want? Bitwig comes with a lot of effects and a lot of instruments, but it doesn't come with as many as something like FL Studio or Reason or Ableton Live. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. It just means that you're going to have to maybe consider some other uses for the effects. You know, think about how can I combine them? What are some of the other strengths of Bitwig Studio where I can actually, you know, use the limited number of effects to my advantage? And I'll just show you quickly uh, before I forget. Basically, all of the effects in here do kind of look like guitar stomp box pedals. There's not a million controls or parameters on here. And uh, it's up to you to kind of fine tune them to get them to sound like what you want. But the other strength of Bitwig, in my opinion, is really in the containers. For some people, this might become too much and confusing and complex, but for me and somebody who's very experimental minded, uh, I love knowing that I can throw on an LFO and then inside of the LFO, I could put in uh, a step mod and then inside of the step mod, I could put another LFO and then inside of that LFO, I can put an FX chain and that FX chain, uh, you know, can kind of work as parallel processing. So I could just put that to 50%. And then I could add an FX layer to this next and inside of here have a dry layer followed by a heavily compressed layer. You know, things like that is very intuitive for me and I enjoy that process. If we had 800 different effects and 500 different instruments, this becomes a little bit too much. But I think when you have simple tools, you can start to combine them in interesting ways and work with the program. So this program kind of encourages you to do this. Um, it encourages you to use all of their built-in containers and modulators to shape your sounds. You may not want that. 
you know, you might want something that gives you a ton more options. Like let's say we have this distortion effect. You might want something that gives you 10 different distortion modes, more EQ, additional drive settings, filters, etc. And there are certainly plugins that do that. You know, don't get me wrong, but this one isn't going to give you all of those options. And so you're going to have to figure out ways to get this to do what you want. Some people are going to be more likely to do that than others. All right, so moving forward here, let's see where we are. Uh, number three, how many plugins will I be using and what type of plugins? So I think in the case of Bitwig Studio, a really unique feature is the sandboxing. So when I say sandboxing, I just mean that the engine of Bitwig, the internal stuff in the DAW works on a different engine than the plugin processing. So if your plugin crashes, then your whole program won't crash. And you can usually just reload the plugin and it seems to save your previous settings. I've been very pleasantly surprised with how that works. The other thing about Bitwig is that it bridges both 32 and 64 bit plugins. So if you're like me and you work with a lot of unstable 32 bit freeware plugins, even when they crash, which inevitably they will crash, it doesn't bring down the whole system. You don't lose any of your work. I've been um, really, really stoked about that. And it also saves you that extra two or three minutes of having to reopen up the project. You can just reload the plugin and jump right back into it so you don't break or lose any momentum. Now, as of this point, Bitwig doesn't support AU plugins, which can be kind of frustrating for some of us, but I understand the reason. If you're making a program that's supposed to work across all three platforms, Mac, Windows, and Linux, you need some consistency there. And so VST obviously works on those three systems, as far as I know, and AU is just you know unique to Mac. So it kind of makes sense, especially if moving forward, they add in things like the online collaboration. It will start to get way too confusing if you have all of these different plugin types that you have access to. So just because it seems like a weakness right now, and just because other things may seem like weaknesses right now, doesn't mean that they won't become strengths in the future for you. And that's what my fourth point is about, upcoming features. Let's remember that we can't assume anything. So right now, Bitwig Studio 1.1 beta is out, and I'm assuming that all of those features will be in the official 1.1 release. But apart from that, you can't assume that anything is coming. Uh, now, if they're able to put together the live collaboration and also a backend modulatory system like what you have in Reactor, I think that those two things are literally game changers in the entire DAW market. You know, those are unique things that Bitwig would be the only software to offer. And if they can do both of those things, I genuinely believe that this can be and probably will be viewed as the most powerful DAW. All right, right now Pro Tools, there's a lot to it. There's a lot of options, there's a lot of features, but a lot of them are kind of a pain in the butt to use. You know, you have to go through a bunch of different menus. It's not super intuitive. Bitwig has to kind of walk a very fine line in keeping it minimal, keeping it simple and clean, but at the same time offering more features. And that's hard. It's a very difficult thing to do. And I give them credit for not really coming out with a million things. Are those people there smart enough and capable enough of doing that? I'm sure they absolutely are. But how you integrate it into a very clean and simple and logical program that's the hard part. And I think that's what they probably struggle the most with working on. But if these two things do happen, uh, we really are talking about a doll of the future in a lot of ways. So here are my final conclusions. And then we'll look at the program one last time. Since Bitwig is still in its infancy, the company doesn't quite know where to take it and what their main market will be. So what I'm saying there is you look at Ableton Live, it's obvious who that's targeted to. You look at Pro Tools, it's obvious who that's targeted to. Bitwig Studio is brand new and they don't know yet who their main audience is going to be. Uh, I would probably say just from using it right now, it's really geared more for creation than say standard production or mixing and mastering. It can be used for those things, but to me, based on the instruments, the routing, the ease of use with automation and all of that, uh, it really kind of feels like it's for creators, for people wanting to do new and interesting things, 
whether that's with electronic sounds or with acoustic sounds, um, that part is totally up to you. But of course, if they start to see that a different group of people is really getting into it more and more, I feel like the features will be pushed in that direction. So if suddenly a bunch of mix engineers start to use Bitwig Studio, I think you'll see features to try to accommodate that market. Uh, but right now, we don't know. It's still so new, and that's actually one of the big strengths of the program. Now, I'm someone who does a lot of experimental stuff, so I'm in the minority. So my opinion about what I want them to add and stuff, it doesn't matter. They're not going to listen to me, and that's fine. That being said, though, whether it's the electronic music maker, the DIY musician, you know, the one just plugging in their one guitar, the mix engineer, whomever, once Bitwig finds its niche, I'm sure they will push their product in that direction. My only thought is that since it's still so young and new, you might actually have the opportunity to help shape where the software goes. And I have to say that I can't make that claim about any other digital audio workstation that's on the market today. That's what makes Bitwig so unique is that it's new, is that you can send them your suggestions and requests, and I'm sure they look at them and consider them very carefully right now because it's so new and because they're still trying to find uh, you know, their main users. What are they trying to use the software for? So last but not least, let's just look in here one last time. And as you can tell, um, it looks similar to everything else that's out there on the market today. And it really is. However, at, however, there are some features here that I think are pretty unique. Um, having all of these containers is amazing. That's probably my favorite part of this program. For some people, you may not need to use that, but for others, you will. And I've been using you know, the FX chain more than I thought. And I don't remember in Ableton if there's a, a mix control. For some reason, I don't think there is, but this is huge. So if you have like a guitar amp plugin, for example, Normally, those don't have dry wet controls on them because it's assumed that you know you're coming in with like an acoustic sounding guitar. But if you're applying that same sort of plugin to a synthesizer patch because you want to give it a little bit of that tube warmth or you know more of an analog kind of sound, a lot of times you don't want that to be 100%. It's too overpowering. So I've been using the FX chain all the time to kind of mix that subtly in, and it's been awesome. And I prefer that to using the FX layer, which is what I thought I'd be using, you know, to do your standard parallel configuration. So if we have just the dry and then, you know, the compressed version, uh, you can now kind of do the same thing using the FX chain and the mix control here. So there's so much power in this software. The hard thing and the thing to always keep in mind though, I think is signal flow. So if you're do ex doing experimental stuff and you have 30 different effects going on any one track, always be careful about monitoring that signal flow. And they don't do a great job with the meters going from device to device. So consider dropping tool effects in there as well. Um, otherwise, there are certainly a lot of things I'd like to see added to the software, but at the same time, I think it's a very strong piece of software for me. It's intuitive, it does what I want it to do, and it helps keep me creative. And um, really with these containers like Midside, the multi-band containers, it makes that routing so quick and easy. Uh, that's what I love about it. Some people don't need that, but other people do. So I hope that this has helped you guys. I know it's not like a standard review, but maybe it can help you thinking at least about the sorts of software and things that you need. All right, thank you so much for watching and uh, take care.